Father, as we come before you and prepare to open your word and hear from you, uh, Lord, we just, as I read this morning in Psalms 146, Lord, it's just so good to bring praise to you. Uh, That psalm starts by saying, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing to my God as long as I live. The very next song 147 begins by saying, hallelujah, how good it is to sing to our God, for praise is pleasant and lovely. Lord, I pray that our praise has been pleasant and lovely to you this day, for it is why we are here, to honor and to glorify you, to lift your name on high, Father, to learn from you, to submit our lives humbly before you, and to allow you to do whatever work it is you need to do in us. So, Father, we pray that you would do just that. We thank you for this time. We ask your blessing now on the time ahead of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever wanted something to happen faster? Like, have you ever wanted something to just happen Wouldn't it be good if we could make things happen fast? Like, wouldn't it be great if you could lose weight right now? Like, before you left church today, you could just be at your ideal weight? Wouldn't that be awesome? Amen? Wouldn't it be good if you could be rich right now? Ah, I got a few amens. Y'all getting this? I'm trying to get your amen or warmed up this morning. Wouldn't it be good if you could just get in shape right now, like, You could go out and run a 5K in 23 minutes, 22 minutes. Wouldn't that be good if you didn't have to work for it? If you could just be ready? Wouldn't it be good if you could get all your marriage problems fixed right now? Wouldn't it be good if you could pay your house off right now? Wouldn't it be good if you could get your dream job right now? Or if you could retire right now? This week in our small group video, Kyle Eidelman, who who put this study together, is going to make a great observation that's going to help us really understand the big idea for this week. And the observation he's going to make is this, it's that most of us want things to happen right now, particularly in, in wanting God to use us and work through us right now. Most of us want to make a difference right now. We want to make an impact right now. We want to have influence right now. But you know, honestly, when we look at the scriptures, that's not normally how God works, is it? Here's the big idea for this week. God wants to do something in you before he will do something through you. If you really want to see God do something through you, because I believe, I mean, y'all are here at church at the early service. You're here to praise God and worship God, and I think your, your heart's desire is that God would use you, amen? That God would do something through you, where you work or where you live or in whatever social circles you run in, you want to make a difference. You, you desire to be a kingdom man or a kingdom woman. And you desire to please the king of kings and lord of lords. And you want God to do something through you. But the reality is, is in order for God to do something through you, you have to first be willing to let God do his work in you. You see, I, I, I believe most of us are in that place. The majority of us are in that place where we say, man, God, do something through me. The question isn't, do we want God to do something through us? The question is, are we willing to allow God to do something in us? Are, are we going to be among the few who are actually disciplined and dedicated and devoted enough 
to let God work inside of us first. I know and fully believe that God can use anybody. I get it. I mean, he used a donkey. <laughs> like, God can use anybody. But the reality is this. Normally, he doesn't use anybody. Normally, he uses somebody who is willing to submit themselves and their lives to his plan and purpose. People, he uses somebodies, he uses people who are willing to humble themselves before him and allow him to do something in them so then he can do something through them. If you'll turn with me to Mark chapter 1, uh, we're going to start in verse 35 today. Look at a short passage of scripture. It's all we'll have time for. But here we find Jesus on, on the day after a very, 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 very busy, full day of ministry. The day before, he was in the synagogue at Capernaum teaching. He ends up casting out a demon. He does some healing on this day after church. He goes down the street to Peter's house, and uh, there he, he heals um, a, a woman in Peter's house, and she gets up and starts serving them, and it's, it's an amazing story. And then after that, the people of Capernaum start bringing all their sick to him around dark, and he works late into the night, laying his hands on people, each one of them, one by one. And we don't know how long he worked. We don't know what time of the day or the evening or the early morning it was when he finally went to sleep, but it at some point, he said, you know what, okay, we're calling it a night. This is good. Um, I'm going to go get some rest. And he stopped. And that's where we pick up the story in verse 35 where it says this. Very early in the morning, this is the next day. While it was still dark, he got up and he went out. He made his way to a deserted place. And there he was praying. Simon and his companions searched for him, and when they found him, they said, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let's go on to the neighboring villages so that I may preach there too. This is why I have come. Now, you have to imagine this is probably the wildest, craziest, and most amazing day the disciples have ever been a part of. It's probably the most amazing and historic day in the history of Capernaum, what had happened the day before. Peter and the other disciples, the entire town, they, they must have all gone to bed that previous night going, man, if he did this today, what's going to happen tomorrow? The anticipation would have been unimaginable. And after all of that, they wake up and they start looking for Jesus and he's gone. They, they can't find him. I mean, imagine if you're the next person in line. Imagine if you're standing there holding your baby or your son or your daughter. Or imagine if you're there and you've been waiting all night with your blind father or your sick mother. Or imagine if you were there waiting for Jesus to heal you. And now he's nowhere to be found. He's gone. So they send out the search party. They're looking all through town. He's not in town. They begin to move further and further outside of town. And when they find Jesus far outside of town in what the Bible describes as the wilderness, they find him there praying with his father. Now why is that important to you? Why is it important to me? Well, it's important for this simple reason if there was ever a person who did not need to do a quiet time or spend time in prayer, it would have been Jesus, amen? If there was ever a person who didn't need to be alone with God, it was Jesus. He was God. He's the Son of God. He's God manifested in the flesh, but still, where is he? He's off in a desolate place praying and seeking his Father's will. If, if it was that important to Jesus, how much more important should it be for you and me? 
I want to point out a few things about this text, a few things about these verses. First, I want you to see the pattern. It's point number one. There's a a pattern in Jesus' life that we can't miss. I don't want to dwell here long, but, but we can't miss this. Throughout the life and the ministry of Jesus, we see a a clear pattern of prayer. We see a pattern of seeking God's will. We see a a pattern of submission. We see a, 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 a pattern of setting aside significant amounts of time to be with his Father. The text says in verse 35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got up, went out, made his way to a deserted place, and there he was praying. He he wasn't sleeping there. He wasn't eating breakfast there. He wasn't enjoying the sunrise there. He was praying there. Before the sun came up, Jesus got up. Now, I I don't believe this means you have to get up before the sun comes up to be with the Father, necessarily. But for Jesus, he knew that if he didn't slip out of town before the first person in town woke up, he wasn't going to have any time alone with God. So for him, he had to get up and get out of there before the sun came up. And you know, we, we, we see this pattern in his life. It's not just a one-time thing. In Mark 6, 46, it says, After he said goodbye to them, he went away to the mountain to pray. In Luke 21, verses 37 and 38, it says during the day he was teaching in the temple, but in the evening, what would he do? He would go out and he would spend the night on what is called the Mount of Olives. Then all the people would come early in the morning to hear him in the temple. So here again we see at the end of his ministry a pattern that's present throughout his ministry. A pattern we see in our text at the beginning of his ministry that continues all the way to the end of his ministry. The same pattern. Teaching all day and then withdrawing to a remote, desolate place at some point in the night or early in the morning to be with the Father. And then after a significant amount of time there with his Father, he comes back to do more ministry in the temple. If you jump to Luke 22, it says this in verses 39 through 42, he went out and he made his way as usual to the mount of olives and the disciples followed him when he reached the place he told them pray that you may not fall into temptation then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw he knelt down and what did he do he began to pray father if you are willing take this cup away from me nevertheless not my will but yours be done humble submission to his father other translations say as was his custom In other words, this is a pattern. This was his usual way, his method. This this was what he did every day. People knew how this was going to take place. We see it in places like John 6, 15, where it says, Therefore, when Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, what did he do? He withdrew again to the mountain by himself. There's a a pattern in his life of withdrawing from the world and the demands of the people and the demands of the ministry just to be alone with his father. He prayed many other times as well in more public places. We see him pray before his baptism in Luke chapter 3. We see him pray before he calls the 12 disciples in Luke chapter uh, 6. We see him pray before he feeds thousands of people with a few loaves and fishes in John chapter 6. We we see him pray before he raises Lazarus in John uh, uh, chapter 11. He prayed in the upper room in Matthew 26. He prayed in the garden in Matthew 26. He prays on the cross in Matthew 27. There's a clear pattern in his life, a pattern of both public and private prayer. Times when he just went to the Father. If you really want God to do something through you, then this pattern is going to need to be present in your life. You see, you have to be willing to be able to get in that secret place, that quiet place with God, and say, God, do something to me. 
if you desire for God to really do something through you. I'm not saying it has to be early in the morning. I'm not saying it has to be in the wilderness. But there better be a time, multiple times probably, in your day when it's just you and the Lord. When you just open the Bible, open your heart, lay it all out humbly before Him. A time when you say, God, do something in me. Work on me. If I had more time, I'd take you on a journey through the Old Testament and we would see that this pattern was also present in the people of li- uh, uh, people's lives like Moses and Abraham and Jacob and David and many more. I love what Psalms chapter 5 verse 3 says. You might want to make this your memory verse for the week or a verse to dwell on this week. It says, in the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. Does God hear your voice in the morning? In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I plead my case to you and watch expectantly. This is an important pattern for the life of a disciple. An important pattern that must be present for anybody who wants God to do something through them. There are three things that will happen if you develop this pattern in your life. The first one is the word preparation Point number two, if you have this pattern of prayer and this pattern of openness and this pattern of asking God to transform you and work in you so that he's able to do something through you, you will always find yourself more prepared for whatever comes your way. I mean, this is the thing about Jesus we can't deny. He's always ready. Isn't that amazing? Like every time something comes to Jesus... Whether it's a tragedy or an emergency or a trial or it's people testing him or trying to trick him. He's always ready. He always has the right response. If you want to be ready to answer the questions your kids have or your coworkers have. If you want to be equipped to encourage your neighbors and your friends and your family. If you want to be prepared for the unexpected. If you want to be ready for trouble and trials and tragedies that will come your way in life, then you better have this pattern we just spoke of in your life. That consistent pattern of being alone with God and allowing Him to do His work in you and to you gets you ready for what God wants to do through you. Look at verses 36 and 37. Simon and his companion searched for Him, and when they found them, they said, Everyone is looking for you. Have you ever felt like that? Like everybody was looking for you? Everybody was calling you? Everybody needed something from you? I bet we've all had some moment, some time in our life, like we felt like that. Like everybody was expecting an answer from you. How many of you are mamas? How many mamas we got in the room? Praise God for mamas. Can we give mamas a round of applause? I know for a fact Every mama in this room knows what this feels like. But I bet every one of us can relate to it in some way at some point. You might not feel like that every day. You might not feel like that right now. But you know what it is to feel like everybody's looking for you. Everybody's looking for Jesus. Everybody needed and expected something from Jesus. And you know what? He was prepared. Because he had a clear, consistent pattern of prayer in his life. One commentator wrote this. He said the proof of his person had been demonstrated in his miracles, but the power behind his action was prayer. He was subject to the will of the Father and operating in the power of the Spirit. Consequently, a time of private communion with his Father was critical. When I don't feel prepared for whatever I'm facing, it's generally because I have neglected the pattern of deep intimacy with God. Honestly, if I'm just being honest with you, when when I felt the least prepared for things in my life, and I go back and evaluate what had happened the days, the hours, perhaps even the weeks or the months prior to that, I can see that I wasn't in that deep intimacy with the Lord as often as I needed to be. 
And conversely, when I felt the most equipped, the most ready, when things have come my way that I would have never expected, and I had the words, or I had the wisdom, or I had the right answer in the moment, I can go back and I can see, you know, man, I've just come out of a deep season of deep intimacy with the Lord. See, I'm the most equipped, I'm the most ready, I'm the most prepared when I've dedicated myself to a pattern of oneness and openness with the Father. A pattern that says, God, do something in me. Do something to me. So that when the time comes, you can do something through me. See, God does the most through me, and he'll do the most through you when we allow him to do the most in us. Jesus was always ready because he, and he was always uh, ready because he was always right with God. He was sinless. He was perfect. He was pure. I'm not sinless. I'm not perfect and I'm not pure. I'm never going to be at that status. It's never going to be like that for me. But I am most ready when I'm most right with God. And the way I can stay in that zone or be most equipped and be most ready is to be with God. And to be with God in a way that doesn't just say, Lord, here's my laundry list of things I need you to do for me today. But to be with God in a way that says, Lord, I want you to work on me today. I want you to transform me, to change me, to teach me. I want you to dig into me. I want you to cut the nasty out of me. Because when I'm not right with God, you know what? I'll never be ready to do whatever it is God wants me to do. If you want to be ready and if you want to be prepared and if you want to be used to do anything for God, you have to get right with God about everything in your life. Not just some of the things, not most of the things. You have to be willing to let God go into every area of your life and truly sanctify you. The next reason we want to see this pattern in our life is it brings a consistent clarity to our priorities and our purpose. Have you ever been so busy that you didn't know what to do next? Or do you ever feel like you're running from one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing and you never you didn't get anything done? You ever had a week or a month or a day where you felt like you did a bunch but didn't accomplish anything? Ever had a day where you felt like you worked harder than you had ever worked in your life, but you got to the end of the day and felt like, man, I didn't really accomplish anything at all? You know why that happens? It happens because we don't really know what our priorities and our purpose is. It can happen for a lot of different reasons. Things come up and things take place that we're not expecting, but I'm really, I'm convinced that for us as believers, as followers of Christ, the, the main reason this happens is because we don't know what we're supposed to be doing. We don't know how we're supposed to be spending our time. We, we, don't, we don't know what God really wanted us to do that day. So we just went out and did a bunch of stuff, but we never got anything done God really wanted us to do. And most of the time, when that happens in my life, because it happens in my life just like it does in yours, I'm not saying I'm better than you at this, but when it happens like that, for me, I can always go back and see, you know what, I got out of my pattern. Didn't spend enough time with the Lord. I didn't spend any time with the Lord. I just got up and went to work because I had so much to do. See, the problem is, many times we jump up, we get out of bed, and we go to work without ever getting in the Word. We slam a cup of coffee or five, and we just race into the day. Before we allow the Lord to do something in us, to get us ready for what he wants to do through us. You see, a, a poor pattern puts us in a poor position to win the day. We don't know what to say. We don't know what to do. We don't know how to respond. We don't know where to go. We, we don't know how God wants to use us, primarily because... We just want God to do something through us before we ever allow him to do something to us. We just want it to be instant, just to happen. Jesus was always ready. He was always right. He was always prepared. He was always in the perfect position. He was always equipped for whatever came his way. And yeah, I get it. He's Jesus, and, and you're not, and I'm not. 
I understand there's a, a degree here of divine advantage that he had that you don't. But I really do sincerely believe that our priorities and our purpose would be much clearer if we spent more time letting God do something in us before we went out and tried to let God do something through us. Look at verse 38. He said to them, let's go on to the neighboring villages so that I may preach there too. This is why I've come. (laughs) On the surface, that's not what you're expecting, is it? I mean, this seems like the wrong answer, honestly. There's huge crowds waiting for him in Capernaum. He's a superstar there. Everybody's happy with him. Some have been there all night. Some, no doubt, got the word of what was happening in Capernaum and traveled through the night to Capernaum to be there the next day so they could be a part of it, so they could get a healing, so they could have a transformation in their own life. There's great excitement, great anticipation in what's to come. I mean, this, to me, I mean, this seems like a great place to start a church. And and Jesus, if you're not going to start a church, at least put up a tent and have a little revival or something. I mean, this, this place is primed and ready. The very last thing I think the disciples were expecting when they found Jesus was for him to say, ah, let's move on down the road. Let's leave. I would have loved to see the disciples' faces when Jesus said that. I mean, can you imagine the nonverbal communication they were probably giving back to the Messiah? What is he talking? What what did he just say? Leave? We're going to disappoint all these people. They're going to be mad. They're going to be upset. They're going to have their feelings hurt. Leave? There's huge crowds waiting for you. Why would you leave? But you see, Jesus knew what his priorities were. And his purpose were. He was sent to preach and proclaim the good news. To proclaim the gospel. In Luke chapter 5 verse 32, Jesus says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That's why he came. In Luke 19.10, he says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. Earlier in Mark 1.14 and 15, it says, after John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus, consistent with his pattern of being alone with his father, comes out of that time in that early morning saying, I know what my purpose is. I know what the priorities the father has given me are. So despite the fact that this makes no worldly sense at all, we're going to get up and we're just going to move down the road. When everybody came looking for him, he had the perfect answer because he had been with the Father. Now keep in mind, this wasn't the perfect answer for them. This wasn't the perfect answer for the disciples. This certainly wasn't the perfect answer for everybody waiting for him back in town. But this was the perfect answer. And I can tell you from my own personal experience that I am always the most sure of my priorities and my purpose when I'm in step with the Father. When I have this pattern that we spoke of earlier, deeply rooted in place in my life where there's a deep intimacy between me and God. It's then when I'm in that place that God is able to do the most through me because I've been able to and willing to take the time to allow him to do the most to me. I read a quote this week from William Barclay that challenged me. At first, you know, it, it, it hit me kind of funny, but the more I reflected on it, the more it made sense. It's a different way of looking at prayer. It's a different way of looking at your time in the Word. It's a different way of looking at our dedication and our discipline to doing a quiet time, being in the Word of God on a daily basis. But the more I reflected on it, the more I think he is right. He said this, he said, prayer will never do our work for us. Can I say that again? Prayer will never do our work for us. What it will do is strengthen us for the work which must be done. 
In other words, God wants to do something to you so that then he can go out and do something through you. So many times I do think of prayer as that, something that will do the work for me. If I just pray about it, well, it'll just be done. Forgetting that most of the time when I pray about things, God calls me then to go do something about those things. I'm convinced that's why a lot of y'all don't pray. Because it works the same for y'all. You know if you pray about it, God's probably going to tell you to go do it. But honestly, most of the time, prayer and time with the Lord is actually what is preparing us to do the work that God is calling us to do, isn't it? See, this week I want to challenge you to pray a little bit different. This week, instead of giving God a list of things you want Him to do for you, or even through you, This week, I want you to ask him to do something in you every time you pray. Ask him to prepare you. Ask him to equip you. Ask him to inspire you. Ask him to anoint you. Ask him to get you ready for whatever it is he needs done. And I think you might be surprised at what happens when you do that. Because I know God wants to do something through every single one of you. But I also know that he has to do something in every single one of you. He has to do something to every single one of you before he can do something through every single one of you. Let me close with this last one. This last thing that happens when you put this pattern into place in your life, it, it produces peace. It's one of the hardest things to find in this life is peace, isn't it? The Bible talks a lot about that. It's hard to find peace on this side of heaven. But when you enter into this pattern, this pattern of prayer that Jesus had, this pattern of deep intimacy with with, with the Lord, this pattern of being in the Word, this pattern of saying, God, do something to me. Not just, God, do something through me. Not just, God, make a difference through me or God, use me in a great way. but, But God, do something inside of me. When you get your priorities and purpose all cleared up, you're going to find a peace that you've never known before. It is especially difficult to find peace if you deal with people a lot. How many of y'all deal with people a lot? Okay, man, that's pretty much all of us. Can I just tell you something about people? And I know you're a people. And I'm a people, okay? Well, can I tell you what I've learned about people? People are peace stealers. They are the biggest peace stealers I know of. I've learned that about people. People are generally very, very happy to steal your peace. And they they do it in three primary ways. There's three primary things people are always happy to do to you. And to me, this isn't just for me, this is for you. I promise you, and you can amen if you agree with this, but people are happy to do these three things to you. I put blanks in there, we're going to go through them quick. But they're happy, number one, to demand things from you. They will demand your time, they will demand your attention, they will demand your money, they will demand your energy, they'll demand your patience, they'll demand your forgiveness, and we're just talking about your kids right there. Like, we had not even gotten to other people. But people will demand anything they can demand from you. We are the most demanding creatures on the planet by far. And they will demand everything from you if you let them. Number two, people are happy to dictate things to you. In other words, they will tell you how to do it. They will tell you when to do it. They will tell you where to do it. They will tell you why you should do it, and they will tell you what will happen if you don't do it. They will dictate everything to you and your life if you don't watch out. And they will steal your peace in the process of that dictation to you. And number three, they will determine things for you. People are happy to determine things for you. They're happy to plan your whole day for you, your whole week, your whole month, your whole life, if you'll let them. Every day of my life, every single day of your life, people are demanding things from you, dictating things to you, 
and trying to determine things for you. And it was no different for Jesus. There was a town full of people demanding his time, ready for their miracle, that they probably all thought they deserved. When the disciples found him, though it's not mentioned here in the text, they certainly expected to bring him back to town, don't you think? They had already made up in their minds and determined in their minds what was going to happen. Everyone's looking for you. Let's go back. Let's get this party started for day number two. Ah, but Jesus, you see, he had been in his pattern. He had been in prayer. He had been with the Father. We could say that Jesus got up early in the morning and left town to find some peace and quiet. No doubt that was probably part of his purpose in seeking a desolate place, a remote place, a secluded place. A place that the disciples would later find him in, but a place that was not so easy to find. But it was there that he was practicing his pattern of being alone with God. And if you've ever just needed somewhere to be alone, then you probably know something of how Jesus feels in this moment. It reminds me of a quote I once read by the novelist Rose McCauley who said that she demanded nothing in this life other than a room of her own. I can relate to that. But I think there's something deeper here, something we miss many times, a different kind of peace. This is the kind of peace that comes from quiet, remote, desolate, isolated places where it's just you and the Lord. It's the kind of peace that brings confidence, the kind of peace that brings joy, the kind of peace that brings comfort in your own life. It's the kind of peace that makes you comfortable in your own skin, we might say, in whatever calling God has given you. The kind that says, even if I'm letting other people down, I'm still at peace. Even if this makes people mad, I'm still at peace. Even if this is not popular, I'm still at peace. Even if this is not something everybody understands, I'm still at peace. Jesus said in verse 38, let's go on to the neighboring villages so that I may preach there too. This is why I've come. Notice he doesn't say, let's go back and say goodbye. He doesn't feel like he owes anybody anything. He doesn't feel like he owes the town an explanation or a reason. He doesn't make a promise to return and come back another day to finish what he started. Because he was so sure of his priorities and his purpose and he was at total peace with his decision because he knew it was what God wanted him to do. The only way I know how to find that kind of peace is to develop this kind of pattern in my life. Where I'm at a place of such deep intimacy with God that I know he's happy. And thus it doesn't matter if anyone else is or not. A pattern that just says, Lord, I, I want you to continue to do things through me. But I recognize that. I need you to do things to me even more. And as God does his work to me, his work through me continues to happen. But a greater work is taking place because as he's doing his work to me and that deep intimacy is there on a consistent basis with a consistent pattern, I find peace. Last week we ended with a challenge. The challenge was, Lord, help me to see. I hope you prayed that prayer this week. Today I want to challenge you with a different challenge for the week ahead. I want you to pray a prayer that says this, Lord, do something in me. Not through me. He'll do something through you if you let him do something in you. So I want you to start with, Lord, do something in me. Every time you open the word, every time you go to the, the Father in prayer, even if it's just for a moment between meetings or on your drive to work, make that your prayer this week. Lord, do something in me. And I know that he will. 
at the beginning of today's message, I asked you if you ever wanted something to happen fast, something to happen right away, something to happen instantly. And the reality is there are very few things that can happen like that. But if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I've got good news. If you're here today or can hear my voice and don't know what would happen if you died right now, where you would spend eternity, I have good news. The good news is this, Jesus is ready to do something for you right now. He's ready to forgive you and to accept you just as you are right there where you are right now. You can be transformed instantly. You can become a new creation before you walk out those doors. You can be brand new this very hour. The Bible says he will transform you and make you as white as snow. He'll clean you from the inside out. He will make you into a new creation. It says the old will be gone and the new will come. And that happens in the blink of an eye. If you wanted, ever wanted something to happen fast, this is it. And if you've never accepted it, I pray that you would. Let's pray. If you're here or can hear my voice and have never called on Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to do so by praying with me. Simply say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up and gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would change me from the inside out. Lord, I pray that you would forgive me of my sins. That you would make me into a new creation. That you would change me. Lord, I thank you for your grace and your goodness, for your love and your mercy. I thank you for dying on the cross for me. Father, as we prepare to close this hour, we are so grateful for who you are and for what you've done and for the clear patterns you show us in Scripture, one of those being our need for prayer and dedicated time with you on a daily basis. Lord, I'm convinced this is why Jesus did it. It wasn't out of a great need in his life so much as it was. He knew we would need a great example to follow. And so he said it for us. Lord, I pray we would follow it. Lord, I pray that we would stop being scared to let you do something in us. Father, I pray that we would stop being scared to pray dangerous prayers like, do something to me, Lord. But that we would humbly bring ourselves before you on a daily basis. Out of a deep desire to be used by you and to be found faithful by you and to have you do things through us, Lord, I pray that out of that deep desire, we would have the boldness to pray, do something in me and to me so you can do something through me. Father, give us the courage for that this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.